Genesis 17, and this is a great chapter for the first of the year. And uh, the title, An Old Man Gets a New Start, um, I think sort of says it. Abraham is 99 years old. Um, let me talk through Roman numeral 1, and then we're going to read the whole chapter together. And, uh, but I'm, I really like this chapter. I really do. Um, is this all there is? Let me try to, if, and if you've got your Bibles, you might want to look at them as I turn. Genesis 12 is where the story of Abraham begins. And we started there how long ago? Anybody remember October? I don't know, I don't know where we are, but we're, we're not on a calendar. We're on a journey. But in Genesis 12, Abraham is called. He's in Ur of the Chaldees, and he hears a voice, uh, whether that was audible or not, that said, Go from your kindred, leave your father's house. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham went. He was 75 years old when he got his calling. Um, several things happened. But in chapter 15 is when God makes the covenant. And this is when the lamp went between the divided animals, remember, and God cut a covenant with Abraham. And what was Abraham's response? Anybody remember chapter 15, verse 6? One of Paul's favorite verses in all the Old Testament. What is it? Abraham believed the covenant promise of God, and God said, that's what righteousness looks like. Justification by faith. Paul talked about it. Martin Luther started a reformation based on basically that concept. By faith, God made a promise, and Abraham said, I'm just going to take you at your word. All right? Um, then in chapter 16, which is the last thing we did before we took our Christmas break, they'd been waiting at that point for about 11 years, if my math is right, to have a baby. Because God had said, count the stars, that's how many kids you're going to have. And Abraham said, well, we're old, but if God says it, I, okay. Eleven years go by. Abraham is 86. Sarah is 76. This is when Sarah com uh, comes up with her bright idea. We need to help God out. And why don't you sleep? It's interesting when a wife tells her husband, when a wife tells her husband to sleep with a young, attractive Egyptian slave that we have, that we picked up when we were down in Egypt. It, that, we talked about all these things. Abraham sleeps with Hagar, and boom, she's pregnant. And who's the baby? Ishmael. And we saw in chapter 16, verse 12, I think, that scripture calls Ishmael what? A donkey of a man, which is so, in, and the title of that Bible study was how to birth a donkey. That though Abraham was justified by faith, his character, I'm not sure, has been changed yet. His status with God, his relationship with God is intact. In fact, it's to be modeled. But he and Sarah, to put it in New Testament terms, are still walking in the flesh. I'd, I, I mean, I'd love to just put our chairs in a circle and say, let's just talk about this, because this is, this is huge. And while we get to the, when you get to the book of places like the book of the Romans in the New Testament that are talking doctrine, what you have in Genesis is not systematic theology, but stories. And say, so you mean it's possible to be justified by faith and still walk in the flesh? It's like, ooh, that's a good question. That's a really 
Good question. And if that's true, can God do anything about that? Does God want to do anything about that? That's an even better question. Welcome to Genesis 17. This is how we got to Genesis 17. We've got a man who's clearly right with God, which is he's just. He's justified. He's right with God by faith alone. But his moral behavior It has some question marks, all right? And hopefully you're realizing that sounds about like the church that I go to. And I've, it's like, that's true too. This is real stuff. Okay, the promises of God. Let me try to see how quickly I can do this to get to the good stuff. So far, on four separate occasions in Genesis 12 to 16, God has made a series of amazing promises to Abraham. These promises are freely offered. God just showed up. There's no explanation of why he chose Abraham. Remember the poem I quote from time to time, How Odd of God to Choose the Jews. I really like that. And it is. It's like, why Abraham? It's like, I have no idea. But for some reason... God is head over heels in love with Ab Abraham and his descendants. He chose them and us through them. It, this is, okay. And these promises seem to be, the first blank, unilateral and unconditional. God just sort of shows up and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. All nations in the world are going to be blessed through you. What do I need to do to merit that, God? God, This is not about merit. I just chose you. I'm going to do it. It's unilateral, and it seems to be unconditional. Again, those are words. I'm willing to discuss them. If you've got better words, you can offer them. But uh, you're getting the point. And so this is where those four passages are, and I've just sort of summarized them. And note especially the, the, the two words, I will. How many times, I, I haven't counted in Genesis how many times God says, I will, I will, I will, I will do something. Um, in Genesis 12, at the call, God says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And in you, all nations will be blessed. Genesis 12, verse 7, he sort of puts it together and says, To your offspring, I will give this land. So there's children and there's land. This is big. Genesis 13, I will give you the land. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. In 15, he says, I'll make your offspring as the stars. So you've got dirt and sky. It's sort of as the as the reference points for the numbers of children, but maybe even the quality of children. You know, God's children are always sort of made out of dirt and heaven. It's, it's, that's good. It's, it really is. It's just good. Um, Genesis 15, your reward shall be great. Your very own son, your very own son will be here. That's the chapter where Abraham says, well, I guess Eliezer of Damascus my servant is going to be my heir. And God said, no, your own son. Now it's the next chapter where Sarah says, well, maybe he means your son and not my son. So let's work with Hagar and try to give you a son so we can help God fulfill this promise. When is it going to happen? This is, this is real stuff. And every one of us have lived in this. Uh, if God gives a promise and decades go by. It's like, really, God? Okay. Um, so I'm finished the bullets there. We can summarize God's promise to Abraham under three basic headings, as I understand it. One, Abraham, you will have many descendants. Count the stars. And there are trillions of stars. I don't know how literally, but or count the dust. Count the grains of sand. It's like 
really, God? I'm, in this chapter, 99 years old, and Sarah is 90. Can we get started now? <laughs> okay, but he said, he keeps repeating it. You're going to have descendants, and the, the biblical word there is seed. And I'm sort of avoiding that term, but that's an important term. And Paul picks up and talks about the New Testament deals with seed, but a, it's a singular and a plural term. Seed can mean one seed, or it can mean a group, a multiple. Okay, number two, the promise is summarized by your descendants will possess, and I just said Canaan, but it's about land. You've got a home. You don't just have a lineage. You have a home. Every one of us are homesick. We're trying to find our way home. Where's home? And the Holy Land, the promised land, and this is why the Middle East is contentious. Because there are the people camping out in Canaan who says, God gave us this. <laughs> and we ain't leaving. And they've got a good point. They've got a very good point. And it goes back, okay, number three, Abraham, you will be a blessing to all nations. This is not just about Israel. If you turn it just about Israel, you become a Pharisee. We don't need any more of them. This is about the, God loves the world. He loves the Egyptians. He loves the Babylonians. He died for them. But he wants to reach them through his people. It's like, oh my goodness, that's the point, God? Yeah, that's the point. It's not about you, it's the world. Okay, I'm excited about this. Can you tell? <clears throat> so what, when those promises come, Abraham, and he repeats them, you're going to have children, you're going to have land, and you're going to bless the nations. How does Abraham respond? The response of faith. Though it would be wrong to call Abraham's response passive because he did leave Ur, he followed the call, he walked, but his primary response was simply to take God at his word. Okay, it's not anything I do. For some reason, you're just promising me land, children, and to be a blessing to the nations. Um, and assume that he meant what he said. In other words, Abraham believed God. This is precisely the response God was looking for. That's what I want, Abraham. All you got to do is believe. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness, which I think is not so much a moral term there as it means you're in a right relationship. You're related to God in the right way, even if your behaviors are still questionable, but you're related to God in the right way if you're believing the promises. That, that's sort of a new thought for me. That's, uh, letter C. Now, fast forward 25 years. Let's look to see and just ask Abram, how are those promises working out for you? <laughs> I love that question. How's that working out for you, Abe? 25 years ago, you left everything just saying, I'm going to believe that God's going to give me children, give me this land, and make my family a blessing to all nations. How's that working out? Now, this is, where, this is our introduction to chapter 17. 25 years go by. So count back to about 1995 in our time. That's a universe ago. You know, just think back. Okay, 25 years pass. What about the, the promise of the land? How much of the land do you own now, Abraham? Well, it still belongs to the Canaanites. <laughs> and uh, periodically we have famine in the promised land. It's not even adequate to support Abraham's and Lot's flocks. Sometimes the land is a battlefield where kings wage war and take captives, if you remember chapter 14. When Abraham dies, 
The only piece of real estate he owns in Canaan is what? A burial plot. A grave. That is incredibly powerful. All of his life he believes God's going to give us this land and God says, I'll give you enough land to bury your body in and Sarah's. Okay, God, I still believe. It's like, okay. What about the promise of descendants? When the promises first came, Abraham and Sarah were already old, 75 and 65. Now 25 years go by. But, and also, the scripture says Sarah was barren. She's not only old, She's barren. The years have ruled out both nephew Lot, he was a moral disaster, and the servant Eliezer of Damascus as possible sons. So when Abram is 86, Sarah suggests they have a son vicariously through the Egyptian slave Hagar, but this created a disaster. Ishmael was a donkey of a man. So what's the lesson? I don't understand it, but God just hasn't kept his end of the deal. He said I was going to have kids. 25 years ago he said that. Now I'm 99. What am I sp- we, we tried with Hagar, but that was obviously a mistake. That was not what God intended, and it created the Arab-Israeli conflict. I mean, that's why the news is on tonight, in part. Um, and you can always sort of press the heaven button. Maybe these promises have nothing to do with this earth. Maybe you just got to die. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's like, I didn't mention the lesson part on the first part. Maybe the lesson on the land is the promised land isn't quite what I expected. I left Ur for famine, for kidnapping. And then what about the promise to be a blessing to the nations? I missed this for a long time. When Abraham went to Egypt, remember that's where he said Sarah is his wife? What did he do? Abraham brought affliction and plagues. That's the right words. To the land of Egypt. It's like, thanks a lot, Mr. Blessing of God, for coming to live in our neighborhood. Uh, he also was involved in warfare with kings who invaded Canaan. Lesson, I can't deal with the dysfunction in my own family, much less think about being a blessing to anyone else. Point being, a man stakes everything on the promise of God. 25 years pass, and basically nothing has changed. What do you do with that? Have you ever been there? Maybe. Okay. So is that all there is? Now, in Genesis 17, 25 years have passed. Abraham is 99. Sarah is 89. The the text says she's 90, but there are 10 years difference. Though Abraham continues in right relationship with God, he's justified by faith. That's chapter 15. Nothing much has changed. His wife is still old and barren. (laughs) Canaan is still in the hands of the Canaanites. And his family dysfunctions and lame attempts to help God fulfill his promises only create more problems for everyone. Perhaps you can identify with Abraham and Sarah. After decades of believing the promise of God, perhaps your life is little different than it was in 1995. I mean, I don't know when you go back, but, okay, Lord, I started this journey. Is that all there is? Question. Um, Though you don't doubt your relationship with God, you realize that your life is rather, these are my words, monotonous, predictable, unfruitful. Each of those words just sort of sting, at least. Is that all there is, Lord? Is this 
Is this what it means to live by faith? There is no skip in your step, no song in your heart, no fire in your belly. Um, maybe the opening words of Dante's Divine Comedy. I uh, love these words. Um, anybody read the Inferno? Have I quoted it here? But uh, it starts, three volumes of a journey start with this word. Midway along the journey of our life, I woke to found myself in a dark wood for I had wandered from the straight path. I think that's sort of where Abraham is at age 99, midway through the journey of our life. If that's middle age, it is for Abraham. But it's like, Lord, is this what it's about? All this is setting us up for chapter 17. Abraham, number three, needs a fresh work of grace. If you want to be Wesleyan Arminian, he needs a second work of grace. He, he really does. I don't fight for terms necessarily, but Genesis 17 is a picture of how God gave an old man a new start. Long before the Bible gives a doctrinal explanation of entire sanctification, it gives us a flesh and blood illustration. Though Abraham is clearly justified by faith, he continues to walk in the flesh. So God brings him to a place where a deeper work of grace can be done in his heart. And you're, we're about to read it. So if my introductions are long, my sermons are short. But I'm setting, I'm setting this up. Genesis 17 is pregnant. I choose my words with significance. And when Sarah gets pregnant at age 90, it's like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? It's like, that's the right response. Uh, notice that Abraham's justification was accomplished when, uh, in, in fact, take your Bibles, we're, we're about to read them anyway. Look at chapter 15, how it opens. Chapter 15 is the key chapter on justification. It begins, after these things, what came to Abraham? The word of the Lord. Chapter 17 begins what? When Abraham was 99 years old, what came to Abraham? The Lord. That, that just sort of makes me pause and think. Because justification, if I understand it, all we really need is the word. I, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but for a, the kind of work that Abraham is about to bear witness to, it, it's like it's more than word. It's God himself. All right. Um, however, sanctification can only be realized when the Lord himself appears. Though this chapter will repeat the threefold, threefold promise of children, land, and blessing, there are five new beginnings. All right? So this is our sermon outline, five-point sermon, five new beginnings. Let me read Genesis 17, see if you can figure out what they are, and we got uh, 25 minutes to do it. Does that work? Um, Abram was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him and said, I am, what's his name? What's your footnote say? El Shaddai. Up until this point, okay, I, let me just keep reading. I, I, don't, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty, walk before me, and literally, it's walk in my face. The idea is the face of God, not just the presence, but God's face. And when we see Jacob, oh my goodness, when Jacob gets to Peniel, Peniel is face of God. 
It's, it's God wants to get face, and face to face with us. Okay, walk before my face and be, he doesn't say do something, he says be something. Be what? All right, give me some, tra- give me some other translations. Blameless. Nobody, nothing else? Anybody got the authorized King James? Anybody know what the King James says? Perfect. Perfect, which complete is an excellent word. Be, com- be whole. It's a very important word. But, okay. So God appears to Abram at age 99 after this 25 years of believing. Is this all there is? I am El Shaddai. Walk face to face with me. Be whole. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. Remember that. He's going to fall on his face twice. This time he falls on his face in worship. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made made you the father of nations. And again, listen to all the I wills. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations. Kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you. Verse 8, I will give to you and your offspring all the land of Canaan. Verse 9, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is the covenant you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. This is the origin of circumcision, among the Jews at least. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant. Circumcision is not the covenant. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Don't confuse covenant and sign. He who is eight days old, so shall my covenant be in your flesh. Verse 15, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Again, listen to the I wills. I will bless her. I will give you a son by her. I know she's 90 90 years old. I will bless her. She shall become nations. Kings and peoples shall come from her. Verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face. Second time. And what's he doing this time? I think he's doubled over with laughter. I would love to be a movie producer and try to get this right. I think... He said, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And he fell over laughing and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? And shall Sarah, 90 years old, start going to Macy's to buy maternity clothes? That's not what the Bible says, but it's close. And Abram said to God, Can't we just work with Ishmael? (laughs) I just love the scriptures. And God said, no, Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Laughter. He laughs, Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I've blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him. I... I, God loves Ishmael. God loves Arabs. Hope we know that. He's passionately in love with Arabs. He wants to reach Arabs. Uh, But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. 
And then the last paragraph is about all the men are circumcised. Abe is 99, Ishmael is 13, and all the other men are circumcised too. Okay? All right, let's try to five new beginnings, a new start for an old man. This is a new year. I uh, found myself as I was going through this yesterday and today particularly saying, Lord, can this be true for me? Okay, this is how I see it. A, first new beginning is there is a new understanding of God. Let me just read what I wrote. It's more succinct. You would think that a man who had been walking with God for 25 years would know God pretty well. Especially if it's Abraham. But as in marriage, <laughs> I've lived with Katie 42 years. And I often say to myself, I don't have a clue who I married. <laughs> I, I, you'd think I would know her by now. I think that's the right illustration. Abraham, don't you know the one you left Ur for? But God shows up and says, I'm El Shaddai. And I think Abraham said, really? What's that mean? And he was just, he, he met God in a whole new dimension. Uh, but as in marriage, you can live with someone for decades and still discover dimensions of personhood that are completely unknown. Uh, so it is with God. At age 99, Abraham gets a fresh revelation of who the God he worships truly is. That's just... William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, years ago, his famous words, if your concept of God is wrong, then the more you worship this deity, the more dangerous you become to yourself and to other people. Dennis, Qu Dennis Kenlaw loved to quote that passage. I've never found out where it comes from, except it's attributed to uh, uh, William Temple. But Abraham, do you really know who you're worshiping? I've been following him for 25 years. That's not what I asked. Do you really know God? It's a good question. Very good. And at age 99, Abraham got a new start because he discovered a new dimension of God, El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is all-sufficient. I think that's what he's getting at. If he's all-powerful, if he's almighty, it means whatever the need is, God's adequate. That's his name. It's like, that's a pretty good name. This is more than a title or a label. It approaches a personal name. And I put a footnote there. Because God's real personal name is what he revealed to Moses at the burning bush. Um, let me just read the footnote. It's at the burning bush, which is about six centuries after Abraham. It was at the burning bush, centuries later, that God would finally reveal his personal name to Moses, uh, which was Yahweh. There, God explained this situation in these words, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. That's a very interesting passage. And it's, I'm not going to go into the, the questions. I'm, but just let me leave it with that. But so, but he meets God not just as the generic deity, 
but he has a name, El Shaddai, uh, at, at this point. There's a huge difference in knowing someone by their title and knowing someone by their name. This is almost too personal, but recently I was with somebody from the university and they kept talking about Kevin this and Kevin that, and, and I was finally, Kevin, Kevin. And finally I said, do you mean Dr. Brown, <laughs> the president? He's like, yeah, Kevin. And I said, are people on campus calling him Kevin? And the answer was, well, a lot of them do. I said, that's beautiful. I, I mean, I don't, it's just, it's a different world if you're dealing with Kevin or Dr. Brown. One is a title, one is a name. Do you pray to God, the man upstairs, or do you know his name? Do you pray to Jesus? Or it, there, That's a pretty important question. And Abraham is getting a new start because I think his faith had basically been in God, a title. That's not wrong. And it was an authentic relationship. He was justified in that. But now God says, you can call me El Shaddai. Really? Um, it appears that for 25 years, Abraham had basically known God as just that, the deity, the man upstairs. The relationship was authentic, but a bit impersonal. In telling Abraham his name, God is giving him access to his heart. And whatever sanctification is, it, it's, God is very personal. Perhaps Abraham's relationship with God prior to this had been rather mercenary. That's a cruel term. Mercenary means calculating. Basically, what's in it for me? Land? Children? Global influence? Sure, I'll follow you. Who wouldn't? What's in it for me? And God has promised Abraham land, children, blessings, international influence. Abraham said, well, sure. Now God wants to explore the motives and expose them. Do you love me or do you love my gifts, Abraham? And let me just tell you, when you hear that question, if you know the story of Abraham, you know where this is going. This is going to Mount Moriah. When God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him to me. And, I, and Abraham said, sir, yes, sir. It's like, wow. <laughs> it's not about what's in it for me. It's about the relationship. Do you know this, uh, A.B. Simpson? A.B. Simpson's founder of Christian Missionary Alliance. Don, did you sing this growing up, Once It Was the Blessing? We, should, uh, we need to sing that some night here. I've never, I don't know the tune, but we'll, but listen to the words. This is just two of the verses. Anybody else know this? Hey, this is, alliance. your alliance too. Go, that's great. Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once his gift I wanted, now the giver on. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. Those are just good words. Once it was my working, his it hence shall be. Once I tried to use him, now he uses me. That's my favorite line. That's sort of my story. Once I tried to make God fit into my plans. Um, once the power I wanted, now the mighty one. Once for self I labored, now for him alone. Good verses. So, to get a new start, you need a new understanding 
of God, even if you're 99 years old. Number two, something else that's new in this passage is a new identity. Abram gets a new name. Not only does he have a new understanding of who God is, but because he has a new understanding of God, he has a new self-understanding. Oh my goodness, that's, and that can happen at age 99. When God gives someone a new name, it is full of significance and indicates a fresh start and often a transformation of character. And we're going to see this big time when we get to the story of Jacob and God changes Jacob's name to Israel, um, but with Abram to Abraham. Abram, exalted father, becomes Abraham, father of a multitude. The real significance is perhaps not so much in the nuances of meaning as in the act of renaming itself. Uh, you can read the commentaries, but I really don't see that significance of a difference in what the two words mean. I think the meaning is God says, I'm going to change your name. It's like, really? Yeah, because you're going to get a new identity. God is giving this old geezer the chance to start again by discovering how grace can transform a 99-year-old heart. Wow. Notice how Abram's, Abraham's new identity is discovered only after he comes to a fresh understanding of God's identity. We find ourselves only when we find God. We find ourselves when we lose ourselves in Him. We see these truths most dramatically at the burning bush when Moses, the first thing Moses said to God, and Moses is the poster child for a third culture kid. He's got an Egyptian adoptive mother, a Jewish biological mother, and he married a Midianite. And when he gets to the burning bush and he realizes he's talking to his creator, the first thing he says is, who am I? L look, read it. It's, it's, it's powerful. Who, and God, you know what God's answer is? The question is, who am I? God says to Moses, I will be with you. <laughs> it's like, time out. I asked you, who am I? And God said, I know. And my answer to that question, your identity is found when I am with you. What kind of an answer is that? It's a genius of an answer. And Abram becomes Abraham. I will be with you. Anyway, Sarai also gets a new name, etc. All right, let me give you the third one. This is my favorite one. We're, uh, we're winding it up. Letter C. The third thing Abraham gets at age 99 to start fresh is a new sense of humor. In verse 3, he fell on his face in worship, but when he heard that his 90-year-old wife was going to get pregnant, he fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> Apparently, the mental image of old Sarah waddling around the geriatric center pregnant was just too much, and he fell on the floor, doubled over in laughter. I think he laughed so hard his dentures fell out. When I wrote this today, I, I, I was just laughing out loud in my office. I, it was a... Things are funny to me that aren't funny to you, so that's all right. But think about this. It has probably been 25 years since Abraham has had a really good belly laugh. Life's been hard ever since he left Ur. I love the guy. He's traveled. There's been Lot got kidnapped. There have been famines, wars, family conflict. Lot and I had to separate. 
uh, Hagar hates me. My wife's always mad at me because of Ishmael. Not to mention all the problems that come with old age, arthritis, backaches, trips to the pharmacy, doctor's appointments, hearing aids, and bifocals. But the thing God is proposing is hilarious, that, pregnant, that Sarah would get pregnant. And this is just how my mind works. Just imagine it. Let your visual imagination run. Sarah's looking under her bifocals as she does a Google search on her phone, shouting to her deaf husband, Hey, Abe, how do you spell gynecology? <laughs> or Abraham with his walker going into Kroger asking the clerk where the pickles are. I mean, this, I would just love to produce these scenes. Or Abe and Sarah attending birth classes, Lamaze classes. I just, or Sarah going to the nursery department after church to pick up Isaac, and the lady in charge says, oh, hi, are you Isaac's great-grandmother? <laughs> or Abraham was perhaps the only man in history who paid his maternity bills with a social security check. <laughs> You're laughing a little better. And after he's born, I picture Abe and Sarah rocking in their rocking chairs on the front porch while, Isaac, while Sarah is nursing a baby. Abe winks at her, and they both just fall over laughing. Because it's just, this is glorious. Who could have done this but God? Far from rebuking Abraham for his laughter, God is laughing too. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. I think all creation was laughing. So God said, let's just give this baby a name that memorializes this new sense of humor forever. Let's just call him Laughter. And that's how Isaac got his name. And I think all the neighbors and the cousins just, every time they saw Abe pushing the baby carriage, just said, that's the funniest story I've heard in my life. One final note. Don't confuse Abraham's laugh with Sarah's laugh. In the next chapter, Sarah laughs. Not all laughter is the same, and not all humor is God honoring. God was pleased with Abraham's laughter, but he rebuked Sarah. And here's the story, Genesis 18. Uh, when the three visitors come to Abraham's tent, they prepare him a meal, and then they have this conversation. The visitor said to Abraham, where's Sarah, your wife? And Abraham said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I still have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you next year and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. And he said, Did too. But that was the laugh of unbelief. God can't do that. It's the rolled eyes and the... D, we're almost done. Uh, a fourth new thing is a new, and I'm just going to say it this way, sacramental symbol. I'm talking about circumcision. I didn't want to just call it a sacrament, but I'm, we're going to call it a symbol or sign. Genesis 17 explains the meaning of circumcision, and the latter references tells how God, Abraham carried it out. God had already made the covenant with Abraham, but now he's establishing the sign of the covenant. A rainbow had been the sign of the covenant for Noah, and now circumcision is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. 
Anybody know what the sign of the Mosaic Covenant is? I should have put this in. The rainbows for the Noah Covenant, circumcision for the Abrahamic Covenant, not really the law, it's more specific. Sabbath, Sabbath. Of, I don't have the reference, but it's in Exodus. Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. That's pretty convicting right there. But, um, the sign does not produce the reality, but it bears witness to it. Beware of confusing the sign with the reality. Paul will say, just because you're circumcised, it doesn't make you a Jew. That's why they hated him. <laughs> and, um, and there are uncircumcised people who are Jews. That's how the New Testament begins to talk. Time forbids to talk about the powerful meaning attached to the many elements involved in this symbol. I'm just going to tease you with these. One, uh, circumcision was given to children. Nobody's asking their permission. Would you like to be a child of God? It's made by your parents. Two, it's given to males only. That's interesting in a world like this. Third bullet, the place of the sign is related to sexuality, masculinity, reproduction. It's like, what does that mean? Next bullet, the mark is physical. It's literally in the flesh. It's not spiritual. It's tangible. Four, or the five, whatever it is, the mark is permanent. To my, to my knowledge, you can't undo a circumcision. It's just, it's very interesting. And the last one, the sacrament of circumcision in the Old Covenant seems to parallel the sacrament of baptism in the new. And the, the whole question of infant baptism is tied to that. I'm not interested in any of those debates, certainly tonight, but uh, they're, it's real stuff. And its, it's origin needs to include Genesis 17. Where do these ideas come from? What do they mean? The most important thing to know about circumcision is that the physical act is little more than formalistic, meaningless religiosity unless it indicates a spiritual reality that has occurred in the heart in what can be called the climactic statement of the entire Torah. Moses puts the matter this way. And the Lord your God will circumcise what? your heart, and why? So that you'll what? You'll keep the great commandment, which is not doing stuff, it's loving. It's about a perfection of love. Walk before me and be perfect, perfect in doing what? In doing rites and rituals and moral behaviors? Not really. In loving perfectly perfection of love. Nobody said this better than John Wesley, in my humble opinion. When I'm talking about perfection, Wesley said, I'm talking about not a perfection of performance, a perfection of love. When God does a work in the heart so that you really can love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that is circumcision of the heart. Like, preach it, brother. That, that's that's good stuff, and we don't hear it. Finally, Abraham, let me repeat you what, what we're doing. An old man gets a new start. 25 years of following God, and it had just sort of gotten stale. God does five new things in Abraham's life. He gives a new understanding of himself. I'm El Shaddai. I have a name, not just a title. He gives Abraham a new understanding of himself. I'm going to change your name. Thirdly, what was thirdly? A new sense of humor. Abraham just doubled over laughing. You can 
Sarah's going to start wearing maternity clothes and eating pickles. Uh, fourth, a new sacramental symbol, circumcision. And five, a new commandment. Walk before me and what? Be, let's just say perfect. <laughs> it's a, God had never told Abraham to be perfect. He had said, basically, follow me, or do this, or do that. But he had never said this commandment, be blameless. The Hebrew word tamim means complete, whole, undivided. I like that word. And simple. Simple not as in simplistic, but as in not complex. You look in Abraham's heart, there's only one thing. Love for God. It's simple. The word translated in the King James is perfect. To be perfect is to have a heart wholly devoted to God. No inner division, no double-mindedness. God had commanded Abraham to leave his home, to travel to Canaan, to not be afraid, to be circumcised. But this commandment, to be perfect, was new. What can it mean? I'm so glad you asked. In chapter 16, we saw how Abraham, though right with God, was still walking in the flesh when he gave birth to Ishmael. God is telling Abraham that he is interested in more than belief and more than right status. What God really wants is wholehearted surrender and love, a circumcised heart a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. The command includes the words, walk before me, meaning to walk in the presence of my face. God wants face-to-face, wholehearted intimacy. This is what perfection is all about, not a perfection of performance, but a perfection of love. And Soren Kierkegaard wrote this book. Anybody read Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing? Ooh, I, this, I have, <laughs> uh, but I bought it because of the title. It's not a very thick book. Kierkegaard's hard to read, but that's the title of a book. Purity of heart is to will one thing. And I think, I think he's right on target with that. It's not about performance. It's about the will. It's about love. It's about being something, not doing something. This is where Pharisees and hypocrites come from, is when we turn holiness and sanctification into doing rather than into being. How does our heart become holy like his? That is what entire sanctification is all about. It's a command to be something more than to do something. God is preparing Abraham for his ultimate test when he will determine whether his heart is, in fact, wholly devoted to him. When he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. That's chapter 22. Yeah, that's where we're headed. Isn't that good? I needed a strong application in the closing, but I didn't know how to pull it all together. I'll let you do that as you sleep tonight. <laughs> and uh, there is a difference in teaching and preaching. And uh, I cross the lines a lot, but I'm mainly trying to teach here. But um, this is really, really good. Lord, thank you for Genesis 17. And I want to thank you for how it's ministered to me and just the times in my life where I feel stale and just I'm doing the stuff year after year and I'm believing the promises, but I don't know if it's making any difference or not. And we invite you to come and do what we can't, and that is reveal yourself to us in a new way. Give us a new identity. Lord, teach us how to laugh again. Lord, uh, show us what we're called to be, not just what we're called to do. 
and do a work of heart surgery in us that makes our heart single, simple, unified, undivided, and pure. Lord, you wouldn't command these things if you didn't intend to do them. And so we just humbly ask that you would have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom, amen.